for some of the hateful and hurtful things I said on this stage, whatever they were, that neither you nor I remember. Perhaps it is a fitting testament to the damaging impact of my actions on this stage that human memory itself cannot contain any specific details as to what they were. It is no small task to be the barometer for the self-esteem of others. As the human incarnation of the Hindu destroyer god Shiva, I too often forget that an incorrect turn of phrase, an ill-timed and improper impersonation, the slightest misjudgment in topical matter, or any other infraction of academic postmodern dogma, could literally set the clock back 400 years in this country in terms of race relations, interfaith dialogue, and beta male enhancement. Good satire, like all good literature, has always been about creating a safe, neutral space for mediocre, uncontroversial ideas to be met with constant sycophantic applause. And all dissent is stifled unless that dissent is projected en masse onto a larger abstraction that has no bearing on the local milieu, i.e. the Catholic Church or Dick Cheney, as opposed to genderless hipsters in tight pants puffing up each other's frail egos in the Mission District. <laughs> Satire has never been about pushing the envelope. Ever since the days of Aristophanes, Geoffrey Chaucer, Voltaire and Lenny Bruce, the art of satire has hinged upon one's ability to echo the mealy-mouthed platitudes of political correctness and multiculturalism, a literary pursuit that if rendered into a tangible solid would have the consistency of oatmeal. I think here of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. I have a dream that one day AT&T will be sure to include images of all races and genders in their marketing materials so as to increase their demographic base and widen their global revenue streams. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their investment portfolios. As adults, we may no longer be in preschool but the valuable lesson we learn there about sticks and stones only being slightly, moderately, if at all painful, while words having the power to obliterate entire cultures, is the same lesson we should carry with us not only in literature and comedy, but in punk rock and any other forms of anti-establishment free speech. Would the works of Jonathan Swift have survived to be whored out as a multi-million dollar children's box office flop if he hadn't marched lockstep with the race and gender identity politics of his age? Would the name James Joyce mean anything to us if he hadn't been willing to prostitute his individual creative vision to become an insignificant dribble in a bowl of collectivist slop? And lastly, would we have ever heard the voice of Will Franken if he hadn't first shut up? <laughs> 